Hey, welcome to our seventh episode of Two Tankers and a Cat. We're your host, Charlie. And I'm Russell. And yes, Lightning is here, and she's been a pain today. Yep. Um, Happy New Year. Yeah, exactly. We're this, in a... This is our first episode of 2019. I'm, we're impressive. That's kind of impressive, you think about it. We've made it this far. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things we want to do is shout out to you. Uh, our listeners, we have discovered, uh, we are tracking our uh, downloads and who's following us and who's listening. And we had no clue when we started this, that it was going to go worldwide. We've got United Kingdom, Australia, India, uh, Ireland, Philippines, Romania, uh, Italy, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Brazil, South Africa, even Cyprus. Incredible, man. Um, guys, we appreciate it so much and, uh, we're going to try to get better content out there. Uh, I have, uh, gotten a few calls, uh, or messages on my Facebook and we've uh, got some messages from our Facebook, uh, two tankers and a cat that, um, they're like, you know, Russell's got a great voice. You know, he sounds like one of those uh, public radio guys <laughs> he goes but this charlie guy cannot get any of these cities right he goes you, you mess up on every french city you mess up on every german city and they're like god bless you charlie but i'm like listen i'm a broke down old fat cop hey you can always go back and take some german lessons or some type you know no i'm gonna <laughs> let our fine listeners in germany come up there and keep complaining until i get it right yeah there you go hey they're like, it is Berlin, not Berlin. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I feel so dumb. Well, today's episode is actually going to be about, and everybody's going to go, oh, no. It's the M3 Lee. Um, I love the Lee. There's history with me and the Lee tank. Um, if you're playing any of the World of the Tank digital da- games or something, and you mentioned the Lee, uh, everybody's like, oh, that's the worst tank ever. No, no, no. <laughs> I personally do not think the Lee is a bad tank. It, uh, boy, I'm going to get some comments on this. <laughs> yeah, and you I, probably will. <laughs> um, the Lee was actually, a, in my opinion, a very, very, very good tank. And I'm going to try to convince some people. Even Russell is looking at me like, uh, eh. it's definitely not one of my favorites, but I, I've, played it a little bit well um one thing is russ brought up, brought up he goes uh so charlie you're saying the lee is a good tank and i'm like yeah he goes you know it's 10 foot tall and i'm like yeah 10 foot tall and bulletproof and he goes well in your battlefield you might not want to be the biggest thing out there and i'm like just a small silhouette yeah. i'm like it's 10 feet tall america <laughs> and most people are like oh you poor poor misguided person <laughs> Russ, um, before we get started, do you want to shout out or give us any info uh, on the Facebook or anything? Are we cool on that? Uh, yeah, I think we're pretty cool on that. Um, like you said a while ago with the stats, I mean, I just want to thank all you guys. I mean, this is way beyond my expectation um, already. I mean, this is our seventh episode, and it's, it's just incredible. I mean, how many people's already downloaded this and give it a listen and we hope it continually grows and, and gets even bigger. I meant to tell you, I did ask a question of viewers uh, a couple of weeks ago about why lightning was licking the back of my head. Oh, no, yeah. And and to come to find out, uh, one of our listeners in the Philippines sent me a message and said, the reason the cat is licking your head is it's part of, your, part of her clan, part of her tribe. She has accepted you, and she's comfortable by grooming you. And I'm like, well, thanks, Lightning. Well, yeah, holy all cow. Right, all right. She don't even lick my head, for heaven's sakes. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> and since I'm, we're both cops and I'm the, I'm the fat one of the bunch, I'm probably the one with the powdered donut stuff yeah, in my but, hair. Yeah, you said it, I didn't. <laughs> it's not gray hair. It's actually just powdered donut. <laughs> um, uh, we also want to thank, uh, again, the... Tank Museum in uh, Britain, um, Bovington. Uh, they have a uh, Friends of the Tank Museum, Bovington. I was contacted by one of their uh, uh, website, Facebook 
um, admins, and he was uh, saying, hey, why don't you have more people support you on that? And I'm like, well, when me and Russ started this, we were going to let people know that we're in law enforcement. And to be honest, we've gotten a couple of things like, hey, we'd like to help you out, but you're law enforcement. And right now, law enforcement isn't really well liked. We don't want to start any controversy. And me and Russ, I, I know this is going to make a lot of people upset, but we're proud of our pr- profession. Oh, yeah, 100%, man. And, uh, you know, we're not going to change how we are just to be politically correct. Yeah. So he's like, you know what? We'll still support you. We support law enforcement, so we'll put some of your stuff out there. And I'm like, sweet. You know, there's a few people out there that still like us. Well, good. Um, well, let's get on this Lee thing. Um, oh, um, one of our episodes coming up, I don't think we're going to do a lot of tank talk, but we're going to be talking about some uh, tank battles. I think I'd like to talk about like the actual Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, yeah, um, that would be neat. Yeah. Uh, we want to talk about Cursed. And, and there's multiple tanks in that, and we're going to be talking about tank battles. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're researching some of that stuff up there. Um, Russ, tell us a little bit how the M3 started and where it was made and some stuff and the names. Yeah, um, the M3 Lee, officially the medium tank M3, was an American medium tank used during World War II. In Britain, the tank was called by two names based on the turret configuration and the crew size. Tanks employing U.S. pattern turrets were called the Lee, named after Confederate General Robert E. Lee, and variants using British pattern turns was known as the Grant, named after Union General Ulysses S. Grant. Now, uh, again, we're not trying to get anybody started uh, about the North-South Confederacy or anything like that. That's just what they named these tanks. Basically, the Lee and the Grant are the same exact tank. Yes. Except the Lee... um, was 10 foot tall and uh, our, our British, our UK uh, friends over in North Africa were like, listen, we like your tank design and everything, but we have one huge problem. We hate your turret. Um, you got to change your turret. And believe it or not, the Lee had a crew of seven and the British are like, you've got a guy sitting in a tank running the radio. The commander can run the radio. We, yeah. you, you don't need one guy just sitting in there, not doing anything except on the radio going, um, yeah, we're here. Yeah, We'll give the British the props. Uh, the UK came up and said, you know what? Uh-uh. Uh, we need the radio in the turret. So they made a space in the back to shove the radio. It's a field radio. And they made the commander the radio guy. There you go. Which, I hate to say it, made the tank shorter. Um, made it better. <laughs> you know, typical American idea and everybody else makes it better. Uh, yeah, the design actually commenced in July 1940. Uh, the first M3s were operational in late 1941. So that was only about a year from when they from when they designed it to when they first were starting to operate them. The U.S. Army needed a medium tank armed with a 75mm gun and coupled with the United Kingdom's immediate demand for 3,650 medium tanks. Uh, the Lee began production by late 1940. We had done earlier episodes in which we talked about a French artillery uh, general who was a, one of the geniuses of you know battlefield tactics, and he had told everybody the first person that can put a 75-millimeter gun on a mobile, you know, uh, platform and get it to go was going to win the war it's so true so and the british and we're not trying to say anything against their tanks but they had the matilda which was not doing very well we will talk about the matilda in later episodes i want to do an episode on that matilda tank but unfortunately that that wasn't a very good tank it broke down in the desert a lot um the sand was getting in there tearing it up they were having real problems the German Panzer threes had what a five centimeter pack gun, isn't that right? Five, yeah, yeah, had, five centimeters, yep. And it was tearing up these slow Matildas. 
got to remember the Matilda was also an infantry tank, and they were making that extremely slow so it wouldn't, you know, speed in front of the infantry. And it didn't have the 75. So when they had access to these tanks, uh, when they started getting the Lees, it started changing the war form quite a bit. It did, just with that bigger gun, yeah. Uh, the M3 had considerable firepower and good armor, but it had some kind of serious drawbacks um which you mentioned earlier with the high silhouette uh, and archaic sponson mounting of the main gun preventing the tank from taking a hold down position and riveted construction riveted construction and and they said it had poor off-road performance the high silhouette i still say i don't think that's that big a problem especially in the desert yeah it does it makes a bigger target i understand everybody's saying the sponson mounting on the main gun uh, it was keeping it from taking a hold down position. You couldn't use the 75, but you still use, I think it was a 37 millimeter turret gun. Now that turret was, you know, 100% ter- traversable. It could go all the way around. Again, I'm defending the Lee, but. You and know, you've got to think too. I mean, all these tanks as they were designed had issues. Well, that's true. I mean, as we've talked about in the last several episodes, I mean, good grief, how many modifications did they make in different models of these tanks? In tank battles, you know, Rommel was a North African commander. We were blowing these panzers out of the water. We, I mean, just driving them back into the sand with these guns that we had. And like I was saying, when they were fighting the Japanese in Southeast Asia, they were destroying Japanese tank. They found that the performance wasn't satisfactory. Um, the tank was withdrawn from combat in most theaters as soon as the M4 Sherman tank become available in large numbers. Um, but so, I mean, as, as soon as they got the M4s off the assembly line and, and into the theater, I mean, they, they started retiring the M3 Lees. I will say this. The M4 Sherman and I love the M4 Sherman. We're going to get into a big episode, and there's so many variants of the M4 Sherman. We're going to talk about how variants of the Sherman was like the number two tank of World War II. But even the Lee, uh, one of the German generals, had said it was better than their tanks. Yeah, it was considered by uh, Hans von Luck, um, a colonel in the German army at that time, and the author of the Panzer Commander, um, to be superior to the best German tank at the time of its introduction, which is the was the Panzer IV, and least until the F1 variant. They had multiple Panzer tanks, Panzer III, Panzer IV, early Panzer IV. We're not talking about the F1 variant. Um, F1 variant was actually kind of a workhorse and got a way better gun. But even when it came out, they're like, wait a minute, this thing's got a big gun, it's got a turret, it's got an anti aircraft gun it didn't have a problem in the desert didn't have a problem in the jungle didn't have a problem in the cold weather in fact they sent them a, a bunch of them on the lend lease to uh australia burma and russia we're going to get into that uh the m3 medium tank well hello lightning hi lightning the m3 medium tank series uh, appeared at a time when allied armor in respects to both the armor protection and armament was generally inferior to their German counterparts in Europe and North Africa. Uh, the M3 evolved from the M2 medium tank and served as essentially an interim solution until the arrival of the M4 Sherman. And, and we got to admit, you know, if you had your choice between the Lee and the Sherman, of course we're going to take the Sherman. And I apologize if you see me getting a little distant. The Wonder Cat <laughs> lightning is all over us. Yeah. Lightning do not do that. She's wanting attention. Yeah, she's wanting attention. And her, tail, and her, tail, <laughs> and her tail smacks my mic. You know, we've got to videotape her. Oh, yeah. Because people are like, I know. we want to see more of the cat. Yeah, I know. We you, will. You guys are funny, but we want to see the cat. I can tell you a little bit of what I know about the uh, Lee um, and the Grant, and we're going to get into the movies, and I know there's going to be... Rust hasn't seen a, cu- a couple of these movies. I think it was 1945, uh, Humphrey Bogart came out with a movie called Sahara. You can still find this movie. Um, the Sahara movie with Humphrey Bogart, he was in an actual M3 Lee. And it was basically, 
after the fall of Tobruk in, uh, in 1942. Uh, it was the Allied retreat in Libya. Basically, an American tanks run around trying to escape uh, the Germans after a big defeat uh, in Libya. And they uh, pick up a bunch of survivors, and uh, they're having a lack of water. And But if you want to see a great old-time war movie with Humphrey Bogart, watch it. It's an amazing story, and it's uh, very well done. In fact, um, they actually did a remake of Sahara with, uh, I think, Jim Belushi. Or John, yeah, it was Jim Belushi. But uh, what's funny about this is the movie Sahara had actually affected, was enjoyed by Steven Spielberg. Well, one of Steven Spielberg's first spoof comedy movies was a movie called 1941. Now, if you haven't seen 1941, it came out in 1979. And I remember my brother took me to go see this at a movie theater uh, in Kansas City. And I got to see this, and it was great. It was a true, based on a true story that a uh, Japanese sub uh, had went to the east coast of California and they had orders to attack oil uh, refineries to show them that you know the Japanese could strike the American homeland. But when the Japanese uh, surfaced, they saw a bunch of lights, and you know uh, they're like, "Oh man, that's going to be an oil refinery." It was an actually an amusement park. <laughs> <laughs> so the Japanese ended up sh- shooting like a cotton candy machine uh, and, a, uh, and a Ferris wheel, and, and uh, uh, wow. hit a roller coaster. So back then, the Americans were just, you know, the American army just said, well, we're going to put it out there that they hate freedom and they hate, you know, fun. So they killed our cotton candy machine. But if you get to research that, it's actually very funny. But in the movie, um, they have a tank and Spielberg couldn't get his hands on a Lee. And I think, well, in the movie, the tank, you'll see it, it says Lulabelle on it. Well, Lulabelle was the tank name in... Both Saharas. They basically start up this fake Lee and try to chase, you know, get it out to the ocean so they can shoot at the <laughs> at the sub. So it, it turns into a big mess. I will definitely have to look that one up and watch it. I have watched the Sahara, the original. Which, which is great. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that was a really good movie. And 1941 is slapstick stupid, but it is funny, and you will see... Um, Steven Spielberg's horrible rendition of a Lee tank. <laughs> but uh, if you do see the remake of Sahara, I think that was, what, 1987? But they did a remake of it, and they couldn't get a Lee. So they went to Australia and got our fine friends in Australia, and they said, well, we don't have the Lee, but we have a grant. And they're like, well, we'll take it. So they actually used an Australian uh, grant tank to make the remake of the Sahara, and they named that Lulubelle wow. too. So if you ever see a tank with the name Lulubelle on the side, you know what it is. If you guys get a chance, you know, check out some of that stuff. By the time of the German invasion of Poland, the United States had little in the way of an effective armor corps, thanks primarily to the lack of vision and a lack of funding from the U.S. Congress. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> there's there's a bunch of people like, oh, oh, you're slamming I, Congress. Here oh, we go. No, no, no it, it, not it, that at all. It was just a fact. Uh, much dedication during the interwar years following World War One placed a greater emphasis on light tank designs, seeing that these systems would benefit the standard infantrymen more than medium tanks would. Uh, the M2 light tank was such a development. But come 1936, the U.S. Army sought a newer and more powerful medium-class tank based on the successful suspension system of the light-class M2s. By August of 1940, a new medium tank design was called for, sporting improved performance, better armor allocation as it pertained to the most potent German anti-tank gun at the time, and a more potent main gun armament. Now, the most potent is that 5-centimeter that we were talking, that 5-centimeter pack gun, which I believe is a 50-millimeter. 50-millimeter. One of the things that when we went down to Georgia, and you'll see some Lees without these, but you'll see this big round weight on the end of some of the 75-millimeter guns. 
and I had a opportunity to talk to uh, Rob Cohen uh, down there in Georgia. Oh, shout out to him. What a great guy. Oh, yeah. I said, well, what's up with the counterweight? He goes, I said, I've never seen that on any other. He goes, well, this is one of the early ones. And they had to have a counterweight because it would hang down. It wasn't balanced. So I was like, okay, that makes total sense now. So they ve- eventually fixed that. I'd like to talk about when it, when they were in North Africa. Basically, the British had captured a lot of 75 millimeter armor piercing rounds and some HE rounds. The American HE rounds uh, had a kind of a weird fuse. It was a direct hit. Like you would shoot it at a bunker, it would be fine if you're shooting it straight on. But if they had b- built in trenches or the tanks were down at an angle and you were shooting at the desert floor, it wasn't very good because it wouldn't do a lob or it wouldn't hit an angle and still explode. Well, they captured these uh, German, well, the Germans had a bunch of these uh, French HE rounds and the Germans had a bunch of APCR or armor piercing rounds. So they basically said, hey, listen, America, we're going to use these French HE rounds because they're a lot better. And it really improved the anti-infantry uh, part of the M3. And they started using the APCR. American APCR, when it would hit a tank, would break apart. The Germans, it would go right through. Or after the British whipped them, up, the Germans a little bit, they captured their stuff and they're like, you know what, we're going to use your ammo. Well... Like we said, they were using this round. And what how, what I'm leading into is that many countries in many wars would take tanks and vehicles from the enemy, repaint them or repurse, you know, rechange their designations and use them. We gave a bunch of these tanks to Russia, these M3 Lees, and the Russians loved them. You know why? Because it was one of the first tanks that had a built-in heater. <laughs> The M3 Lee could hold seven people, and it was one of the first tanks that had a built-in heater. Had a built-in heater. So if you're in Moscow, you head towards Finland, fighting German tanks, and it is freezing. I mean, we're talking Russian cold. I don't know about you, but I'd say that's almost a luxury. Yeah. So when these tank crews are, you know, you know, talking to their commanders, the commanders are like, what do you think of these American tanks? And they're like, oh, they're great. They're wonderful. <laughs> and they were because everybody says, well, the Lees were used against the Germans and the Finnish? And I said, well, yeah, because the when they invaded France, they had captured a bunch of these French tanks. Well, they sent them up to the uh, Finnish border because they really didn't want to use their top tanks, I guess, because they knew they were going to be pushing towards Kursk and Moscow and stuff like that, but they still needed them. But there were for some French and Finnish and some Germans that were up there fighting in these French tanks. Well, Lee was just pounding the stuff in out of these French tanks, no problem. So they were, you know, it was, it was doing good in the snow. It had a built-in heater. You know, these guys were having, they didn't have a problem with the Lee's. Nothing wrong with that. Now, against the Tiger tank, yeah, we all know what a Tiger <laughs> tank is going to do to a Lee. You know, I'm not trying to say that, but against where they needed them and what they needed them for, the Russians were really happy with these. Now, I, I've talked to Russ about a little bit about this, and this is where I'm going with this story. Um, the Germans had captured a Soviet M3 Lee tank, and they repainted it in German colors, um, made it uh, tank number 135, and they put the crew in it. And believe it or not, the Germans liked it too. They were turning around and found out that they could kill Lees with Lees, effective against the T-34s that, you know, they saw up there and some of the other Russian uh, armored cars and stuff that they had up there. If you ever get a chance to get any information on uh, the German captured Lee, uh, number 135, please contact us. With it. We, I'm really interested. In yeah, this. that is an interesting story. I just know that the turret commander... Uh, the turret gunner of the 135 had actually shot down a couple of Russian low-level a- anti-tank airplanes. They would wait until there, and the, the, it had pretty good elevation on the turret gun, and this German guy would wait for him to 
you know, come out of the woods, you know, over the treetops and just bam, shoot, shoot them cow. down right there. So they turned the Lee that they had into a anti-aircraft killer. So that's kind of amazing. Tell us a little bit about the operational history. Of the almost 6,000 M3 variants manufactured in the United States, uh, about 2,800 of those were officially handed over to the British government, which, as you know now, that that was considered the M3 Grant. M3 Grant first saw action with the Royal Armored Corps in North Africa during May of 1942. However, most of the M3s ordered by the UK quickly became surplus uh, to the requirements of the British Army. 1,700 of those were transferred to the Australian Army for home defense and training duties in Australia. The 1,700 was sent for the Australian home defense. you got to remember, Australia could, I mean, the Japanese have already uh, invaded the Philippines, conquered that. Next thing was, you know, Australia. And believe it or not, the Lee was, you know, the Grant variation was extremely effective against Japanese armor. We're, I will talk, we're, we're going to do one episode on Japanese tanks. <laughs> but, oh, come on, we might be able to get two. No, no. <laughs> Basically, the bad part about Japanese tanks is they were made with rivets. And if you don't know, if you get hit by any kind of high explosive round, those rivets break and basically your tank will fall in on itself yes. and crush your crew. And plus be hundreds of little parts that's going to probably fly through your body too as as everything explodes. Yeah, those rivets will become all, you know, just shrapnel exactly. inside the tanks. And, and we're not trying to say anything against the Japanese or anything like that, but... It, Using rivets was a bad idea. Actually, the Lee had rivets at yes. the beginning. Yes, at the beginning. And they were like, hey, no, 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 don't put mm-hmm. rivets on it. And they actually uh, did like a little modification. Um, where else did they send these tanks to? The British Indian Army received about 900 of the grants. Now, these are the tanks they used in Burma, correct? Yes, yes, the grants. Um, the grants were... And the, the British Army had in Burma. If you haven't read the horror of that battle uh, in the Japanese and the Burmese fight, it, it was very cruel. I believe if you watch a movie called uh, Bridge Over R- River Kwai, it was about the Japan- or, uh, some captured British POWs that were forced to make a bridge over in that. Very, very uh, tough fighting there. But these grants were just whip and tail they were shooting these japanese tanks and blowing the crap out of them and they were using the you know 75 for any infantry and were rolling over these guys and the lee was even though it was a grant variation was still very tall going through the jungles and we talked a little bit about going to the russians how many did they send to the russians yeah yeah about uh, 1400 of the lees were exported directly from the united states to the soviet union uh, although about only 976 of those reached the Russian ports um, due to German U-boat and air attacks on Allied convoys. If you look at some of the stuff, National Geographic and uh, some of the private collectors, they're finding that these U-boats that hit these um, convoys and these ships that were sank with these boats, that they're actually pulling up some of these old tanks from the seabed and the restoring them. I think over in Belarus, uh, one of the collectors has brought up uh, two M4 Shermans from the bottom of the sea and is starting to rebuild them and clean them up and making them, you know, museum pieces. And how great is that? Oh, yeah, that's that's absolutely incredible. I Yeah. And you know they're probably in pretty decent condition. I mean, it'd be a heck of a lot easier to reconstruct something like that than it would be something probably buried in the mud for all those years and you know how much i enjoyed uh reading about you know uh, the german uh desert fox rommel when rommel came up did rommel ever say anything about the lee yeah actually i ran across where he noted 
up to about May of 1942, he states, our tanks had in general been superior in quality uh, to the corresponding British types. Uh, this was no longer true, at least not in the same extent. Now, I, I had said there uh, hadn't been any Lees in the Battle of Kursk. I was mistaken. Um, there was actually a pair of uh, Soviet M3 Lees at the Battle of Kursk. Um, I don't want to say that they weren't there. Uh, that's how much the Russians enjoyed these tanks. Like British Commonwealth units, uh, Soviet Red Army personnel tended to refer to the M3 as the Grant, uh, even though all of the M3 shipped to Russia were technically of the Lee variants. The official Soviet designation for it was the M3C or M3 Medium. To distinguish the Lee Grant from the U.S. built M3 Stuart light tank, uh, which was also acquired by the USSR under Lynn Lease, and is officially known there as the M3 Light. Due to the vehicle's petrol-fueled engine, a high tendency to catch fire, and its vulnerability against most types of German armor the Soviet troops encountered from 1942 onwards, the tank was almost entirely unpopular with the Red Army since its induction into the Eastern Front. And... When they say that, they're talking about the actual parts down in the southern parts of Russia, Kursk and stuff like that. You know, and they're like, hey, listen, you know, we're trying to fight German tanks against this Lee, and, it, and it's crap. And, and, of course, it's going to be high-centered. They're out in, the, you know, out in the plains of, you know, the wheat fields of uh, Russia, and... Uh, and we were confusing. In fact, me and Russ even got confused about the M3 Lee and well, the M3 Medium and the M3 Light. So the Russians were calling it like he was saying the Grant and the M3 Light Tank. So they were calling it the Light Tank. Um, with almost what 1,500 of their own T34s being built every month, the Soviet use of the M3 Medium Tank declined. After 1943? Yeah, middle of 1943. Soviets still fielded their Lee and Grant tanks on secondary and quieter and less action fronts. Like we're talking up in uh, around Norway and stuff like that. And, you know, when they were using it against those uh, French tanks, I think it was called the Soma S-35, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, which is limited to the extent of, you know, the northern fights and stuff like that. Tell us a little bit about the Lee in the Pacific War. Uh, in the Pacific War, armored warfare played a relatively minor role for the Allies compared with that of the naval and infantry units. Didn't use a lot of armor and tanks on the Pacific front. Well, when you got the Marines hopping up from island to island to island. Yeah. Not, not a big... Not real practical, I guess you would say. Yeah. In the Pacific Ocean Theater and Southwest Pacific Theater, the U.S. Army deployed none of its dedicated armor divisions and only a third of its 70 other separate tank battalions. So, yeah, they did not deploy a lot of their tanks. Well, I know a small number of M3 Lees saw action in the Central Pacific uh theater during 1943. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the U.S. Marine Corps deployed all six of its tank battalions. None of these were equipped with the M3 Lee. Uh, the U.S. Marine Corps tank battalions were equipped initially with the M3 Stuarts, which were replaced by the M4 Shermans in mid-1944. So they really didn't have any of the M3 Lees with them. So they had a, a few of them, but... They were wanting more of the Shermans. Yes. And the Sher Shermans, you know, they, I love the Sherman, so you can't say anything against it. I, if I had my choice to go on an island, um, I know even some of the Sherman variants were actually uh, floatable. They were used in Normandy, and uh, they had, like, they could actually turn in almost to, like, a little floatable tank. Yeah, I have seen and, that. And we're going to talk more about that. They even had a propeller on it. And we're going to talk about the m4 i know we keep hinting that we're going to do but that's a big episode yeah we might even have to break that into i'm two episodes. thinking we're probably going to have to break that one up yes 
in the Pacific Ocean Theater, um, the only combat use of the M3 Lee by the U.S. Army uh, appears to be against the Japanese forces uh, occurred during the Gilbert and Marshall Island campaign of 1943. And that's following the better-known landing at Tarawa. Um, they, I know they made an amphibious uh, landing on the Macon Island with armored support from a platoon of uh, M3A5 Lees equipped with deep wading kits. Um, if Again, there's just another thing out for our fans. If anybody has any pictures of these deep wading kits um, or any information on these deep wading, wading kits for the Lee, I would love to see the Lee look like a boat. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with you. That would be an interesting photo to see. Um, can you give us a little, uh, you know, we haven't talked about the stats. Why don't you yeah. give us the stats like you normally do? The M3 Lees were produced between August of 1941 through about December of 1942 with almost, well, it looks like a little over 6,000 of them being built. There's numerous variants that were built. Including the waiting the uh, waiting, yes. One we, we, that yes. we want information on. So the M3A5, Lee, yeah. Uh, the weight was about 27 tons. Nice. Length of the vehicle was about 18 feet 6 inches. So, pretty long tank. Pretty long tank, yes. It was about 8 feet 11 inches wide. Uh, comfortable, right? Yeah, that would be fairly comfortable compared to some of them we've been talking about here lately. Absolutely. The height, which we've already mentioned before this evening, about 10 foot 3 inches high. Uh, I know, I yeah, know. That's... People are going to say, see, we told you. And I'll be honest with you, I'm probably with those other people. Uh. I don't think I really want to be having that big of a silhouette. But that's <laughs> just my opinion. But you got to think, my America. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the crew for the lead was, what, seven and six for the grant? Yeah. So they really did have just one guy yeah, in there running the radio. They did. Um, what kind of armor are we talking about? It, it looks like that the whole front, the turret front, and the sides and the rear were all about 51 millimeters thick. Well, that's not bad. Not bad. The whole sides and the rear was only about 38 millimeters. So. Mm. Yeah. Again, whole sides yeah. and rear is always going to be weaker. Oh, that's true, yes. What kind of main arm- armaments did they have? It had one 75mm gun designated M2, M3 in the hole with 46 rounds of that. And it had one 37mm gun designated M5 slash M6 in the turret with 178 rounds for that gun. Now, if you've never seen the Lee, and I should have brought this up the very first, the Lee, the 75 millimeter gun, wasn't on the turret. It was on the hull, and it had a little swivel. And it was basically used for, like, the anti-infantry, shooting at bunkers, uh, fixed targets. And the actual 37 was on the turret, and that was more used for any aircraft um, anti-tank. What kind of second secondary armament did they have? Yeah, secondary armament, they had, depending on which variant of the M3 Lee we're talking about, they had anywhere from two to four uh, .30-06 Browning machine guns. And let me clarify. Um, on the four, they actually had two of these machine guns that were controlled by the driver. If you look at the front of the Lee, most of them, if you see some of the older pictures, you'll see two machine guns coming out right where the radio man would actually set. And the radio man could, you know, raise it up and down, uh, but the driver could actually fire the machine guns. But they were fixed, so they thought that was a terrible idea. Once they found out that the driver would be going around and he would see a target, whether it be a tank or, you know, anything, the driver would start turning the tank left and right to machine gun these stuff. And they're like, whoa, 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 you're messing with our big guns. We need to hit this with. So they actually took the machine guns out and used it to carry that, you know, where the machine guns were. They took that out and they used that space to put water and more ammo and stuff like that. 
but they filled up those two holes. So when you go see a Lee, and there's tons of places to see Lees, you'll look at the very front and you'll see the two holes, but they'll be filled up with like a concrete uh, type material that they uh, poured in there. Because they found out, you know what, we really don't want our drivers shooting and turning and spinning when we're trying to actually do combat. So that's where they got rid of those guns. But originally they did have these 30-odd-6 Brownings sticking out the front of it. The M3 Lee had a right Continental R975 EC2 engine, about 400 horsepower. The transmission was a Mack Synchro Mesh. Forward five speeds and one reverse speed. Yeah, you, 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 I don't see much need for five speeds. But yeah, on a four hundred, but but you definitely need the reverse. <laughs> yeah. What kind of suspension did that thing have? It had a vertical volute spring suspension, about a total of about eighteen inches ground clearance. In comparison to other tanks, I don't know where that fit. This crazy looking tank that we're talking about actually. Carried about 175 U.S. gallons of fuel. Wow. What kind of range did that give it? Well, it had a range of about 120 miles, believe it or not. So on a tank, full tank of gas, that thing can go 120. I guess yeah. that, when you're out in the desert and you can't fill up, you're darn that's right. the tank you want. That's right. So if it was on a good you know, desert road top speeds, what kind of speeds are we talking about? Uh, it looks like top speeds on the road is about 26 mile an hour. And off-road, about 16 mile an hour. So you figure probably most of the desert conditions they faced in northern Africa was probably off-road. So Yeah, still pretty quick. Yeah, still not pretty bad. Quick. Not bad at all compared to some of the earlier tanks we've talked about. Uh, probably beats my little Kia Rio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, What what is your top speed on your little Kia? It depends. If I get stuck on some gum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If somebody threw some gum in the parking lot, my tire's on it, I'm, I, I'm not going anywhere. i got to go scrape the gum before I can. That's if the crazy thing will start when you go to start. <laughs> oh, God, that's true. <laughs> I need a new car. Oh, well. Uh, have we set up our Patreon yet? No, we have not. Um, I'm still working on that. I'm hoping that by the end of January, I know I keep pushing it back a little bit, but uh, I want to do it right, get it out there to where you folks that, that do want to support us monetarily um can do so and donate yes and what that would mostly be used for is uh server i mean it costs a little bit to place these podcasts on a server um and so it would be to offset some of those costs to get this stuff out to you guys so we'll be working on that and like i said um, I'm going to bring this episode to a close. Um, we've talked about the Lee. I hope you've enjoyed it. But uh, some of the things that I want to touch on, we are going to try to get our Patreon for, up for 2019. Um, I've been getting multiple emails and messages on our Facebook site. Nobody's called us yet. Do we still have our phone number up? Yes. Is, um, it, is it on our Facebook site? I It is on the Facebook site. I will put okay. that back up there. Um, yes, we have not got any voicemails yet. Now that you mentioned it, I'm no. glad you mentioned it. Feel free to call us. Please uh, do. I mean, I, I think you can even call internationally on the most possible yeah, you can. Yeah. Because it's kind of through the internet. Yeah. Um, but again, we enjoy doing this, but we do need your comments. We do need your advice. Um, and throw us some hate mail on me. I know. And if you want more videos of Lightning the Cat, we're going to try to get those up. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other information before we close this out? No, not really. Don't have anything else. Excellent. Well, if you do have any questions or comments, please go to our Facebook site and uh, give us anything that you need or, or you want to hear from us. So for this episode, this is Charlie. And this is Russell. You crazy. Yeah.